Hello all and welcome to our webinar. I'm Dr. Mustafa Kansas and I'll be your moderator and host. I'm also the Director of Product Management for the Mirage and IR Raman Microscopes. I take great time in introducing two absolute legends of polymer vibration spectroscopy as our two speakers for this webinar, and that would be Dr. Kurt Marcot and Dr. Isa Wernoda. Before we dive into it, I want to give you a short bio though uh, on their backgrounds. Uh, Curtis Marcot is currently a senior partner at Martlight Solutions, a spectroscope consulting firm, and also currently an affiliated professor of material science and engineering at the University of Delaware, and is also an adjunct professor in the Department of Chemistry and Biochemistry at Miami University in Oxford, Ohio. Kurt obtained his PhD in chemistry from the University of Minnesota in 1939. He's a former research fellow at Procter & Gamble, where he worked for almost 30 years. Kurt has held several positions with many different spectroscopic societies over the past decades, and has also won many awards, far too many to list out here. But as for a short bio for us, well, he was born in Tokyo, Japan. He came to the United States in 1969 and graduated from Columbia University in the city of New York in 1974 with a BSc degree in chemical engineering. He has received his master's in engineering in 76, as well as, as, well as his master of philosophy in 78 and PhD in 79 in chemical engineering, also from Columbia. In 1997, he received a doctor of science degree in chemistry from the University of Tokyo. He has worked at Procter & Gamble in Ohio from 1978 to 2012. After retiring from Procter & Gamble, he became Chief Science Officer and Senior Vice President of Innovation at Thomas Scientific, Cambridge in Georgia. He holds a position of affiliate professor at the Department of Material Science and Engineering at the University of Delaware. His main experiences lie in the broad area of polymer science. He's well known for the invention of the novel class bio-based and fully biodegradable plastics based on medium chain length polyhydroxyalkylamate coat polymers with are now commercialized under the trade name of Rodex by Dana Scientific. He, he has about 90 patents granted in the US and EU and has published over 400 articles in peer-reviewed journals and has co-authored many books. In terms of a short introduction to photothermal spectroscopy, or PSC for short, PSC has pioneered the breakthrough technique of optical photothermal infrared, or OPTI for short, that eliminates key limitations of traditional infrared Spectroscopy, providing submicron spatial resolution for infrared and transmission like FTIR quality spectra in non contact reflection mode. More recently, PSC has developed the world's first simultaneous and infrared Raman microscope imaging system, providing IR and Raman data from the exact same spot at the same time and from the same spatial resolution. PSC's vision is to enable the power of infrared spectroscopy to be, to be applied to high value problems in industry and academia by the adoption of OPTIR. Dr. Kurt Marco will kick us off. He'll take us through uh, the background principles and short applications review before handing over to Dr. Marco to get to the main topic of bioplastic characterization. Throughout the webinar, you can type in comments and questions and we'll try to, an and we'll try to answer these at the end. Should we run out of time, we'll get back to you our email ASAP. All right, Kurt, I'm going to um, hand over to you at this point. Uh, I'm going to go through an outline of the presentation. I'll go through some uh, limitations of FTIR microscopy and then, uh, talk about how we do optical photothermal spectroscopy using the Mirage platform. Then I'll talk about the new capability that combines IR and Raman and some other applications of Mirage. And then I'll pass it over to Asao Noda to talk about the work in our recently published paper on uh, bioplastics. Infrared microscopy and spectroscopy has been around for a long time. IR spectroscopy is a study of the interaction of light with matter. IR light excites specific vibrations of bonds between chemical structures, and you trace out as a function of wave number uh, the IR absorption spectrum gives you a fingerprint of the microstructure of material. So IR has been used microscopy uh, in the microscopy mode for about 30 years now, and there's many applications in the areas of polymers, life sciences, forens forensics, uh, pharmacology, uh, pharmaceuticals, cultural heritage, and geological sciences. But there's some limitations to IR microscopy. One of them is spatial resolution. Uh, 
These are two images of an Air Force bar target, one recorded in the visible and the second one recorded with an infrared camera. And because the wavelength of light in the infrared is on the order of 10 to, 10 to 20 microns, that limits the spatial resolution you can achieve. Uh, another limitation of infrared microscopy is uh, complex sample preparation. Uh, IR absorbances are extremely strong and uh, requires thin samples to get good transmission spectra. Alternatively, you can use attenuated total reflection, but it requires contact with the sample where you risk damaging the uh, HDR crystal, which is expensive, and you also risk cross-contamination as you move from point to point on the sample. Ideally, what one would like to do is simply bounce the mid infrared radiation off the sample and look at the reflected light, like you would do with Raman and near infrared spectroscopy. The problem is when you do that, uh, most of the infrared light isn't reflected, and what is reflected contains lots of dispersive and scattering artifacts. The most true spectrum you can infrared you, spectrum you can get is of a thin film transmission sample. So if you take a thin film transmission spectrum of a polymethyl acrylate film, it comes out looking like you would expect the spectrum to look. If you measure that transmission spectrum of a 15 micron bead, 10 micron bead, and a 5 micron bead in transmission, you can see the spectra start to distort dramatically uh, as you change the dimensions of the sample. With the new uh, optical photothermal mirage technique, you can get around all four of those uh, problems with uh, infrared spectroscopy. Uh, so the way the technique works, you have a submicron IR spatial resolution and spectroscopy using optical photothermal infrared spectroscopy. You get Rama-like spatial resolution with uh, infrared spec uh, spectral information. The spectra look like FTIR transmission spectra, even though they're measured in reflection uh, without any distortions or artifacts or interference fringes. It's measured non-contact. And that minimizes sample preparation and pres preserves the molecular orientation. And the spectral resolution is not dependent on the IOR wavelength. So this is a little video that shows uh, how the capability works. The sample has IR absorbing regions and non-absorbing regions showing in blue and brown. And if, as you put the infrared pulse laser source on the sample, it illuminates a large area defined by the diffraction limit. We send a second probe laser through the exact optical path, but it focuses to about a 20 times smaller optical spot. And uh, we look at the reflected uh, green laser light to get the infrared spectrum, which we can record in a matter of a second if we want to. Uh, this is a, a, another picture of uh, sort of the optical schematics of it. Uh, you have your pulse tunable IR source that is combined with a visible laser source, of a shorter wavelength, and they're both sent through the same uh, Cassegrain objective onto a sample that sits on an XYZ stage. And you can see that the diffraction limited spot size of the visible green laser is much smaller than the than the uh, red in red laser. The light then uh, that's uh, if the sample absorbs these. Uh, it photothermally expands, and the refractive index and the sample actually expand, and they modulate reflected green light. And so the green light coming in is, is not modulated. The IR laser light is modulated, and the reflected green light that's modulated is only modulated when you're in a region where the IR absorbing species is. So you then uh, send that laser back to a visible detector, and you tune to the modulation frequency of the pulsed IR laser. And from that, as you sweep the laser wave number, you can get the spectrum. Uh, or you can sit at a particular wave number and get an image. Um, you can collect these spectra were all collected in, in less than one minute uh, along this line. And these images are at the specific wavelengths A, B, and C of this multilayer film sample. So the key differentiators between uh, FTIR and Q QCL microscopy are you came Raman like submicron spatial resolution, but you get infrared spectral information. It operates in reflection mode without dispersive scatter artifacts 
like me scattering base light offsets or tilts. It gets you more confident data that does not require time consuming corrections, and it's fully compatible, uh, comparable spectra to traditional FTIR. So there's a single point detector, uh, detector ar architecture with no spatial or spectral laser coherence artifacts, and there's no need to microtome thin sections. You can work on thin sec thick sections uh, from 100 nanometers thick up to several millimeters thick, so it's not nice for those difficult to cut samples. You can measure right off a, a block cut of a multi-layer film, and, and uh, that's what Asa will be talking That's how the samples that Asa will be talking about later were prepared. So if you take a comparison between traditional IR, FTIR microscopy and Raman microscopy, you can see there's various advantages and disadvantages. Spatial resolution, Raman is better because it's a smaller spot size. Uh, if you have a fluorescent sample, IR works great, Raman has a problem. Uh, spectral sensitivity, uh, generally infrared is most samples much more sensitive than Raman. Uh, speed of measurement, infrared is generally faster than Raman. There's extensive uh, databases of infrared spectra, not so extensive for Raman. Uh, but you have to either measure, you can't measure very easily in, in, uh, in reflection with infrared, whereas you can with Ron. Uh, traditional FTIR is very sensitive to water vapor fluctuation, whereas Raman isn't. Uh, you have problems with water uh, solvents, aqueous solvents with infrared, which you don't with Raman. You can't work with glass substrates in the infrared, but you can with Raman. And the spatial resolution is independent of wavelength for Raman, but not infrared. Well, if you take a look at what uh, Photothermal, uh, optical photothermal microscopy can be, it takes the best of both worlds out of both techniques. So now you can get around uh, the trade offs between IR and Raman, and with a simple OPTR microscope, you get all of the advantages uh, that would take two techniques to do just with OPTR microscopy. Spectra look just like transmission spectra, even though they're measured in reflection mode. Uh, so these are three relatively thick polymer samples uh, that you would not be able to normally transmit light through in a regular FDIR. We can collect spectrum and reflection and search them against databases of the know-it-all uh, databases of IR spectra, and we get perfect matches with spectra that were collected as thin films and transmission. There's a black spectrum and a red spectrum overlaid. The red spectrum is the library, and the green is really, really good between the spectra. Uh, if we compare spectral resolutions between FTIR microscopes, quantum cascade laser microscopes, and uh, OPTIR microscope, you can see that the spatial resolution uh, changes as a function of wavelength. It depends also on the, uh, the numerical aperture of the objective. But in general, uh, you get consistent spatial resolution up to about 20 times better across the whole uh, mid infrared range compared to conventional uh, FTIR and QCLIR uh, microscope system. In this case, uh, with a 532 laser, it works out to be 416 nanometer spatial resolution. Uh, here's an example of an example, uh, two one mi micron diameter polystyrene beads embedded in epoxy side by side. We collect a series of spectra along a line across the boundary and uh, between them and uh, going from the epoxy into the uh, polystyrene and back into the epoxy, and these spectra transition with a, within about 400 nanometers from being epoxy-like spectra to uh, uh, polystyrene spectra. This is a real uh, sample of multi-layer packaging film uh, for food, uh, where we show two spectra that were collected 500 nanometers apart in different layers, and you can see a clear transition between these the ethylene vinyl acetate copolymer and uh, more of a polyethylene layer, just within a 500 nanometer step. That means you can get in and sometimes and detect these important high layers that are in multi-layer film samples. Uh, there's two new capabilities that have just come around. Uh, one of them we're, we're going to talk about today is the combination of IR and RON. And uh, 
here's an example of a spectrum of polyethylene terephthalate, and it shows the complementary nature of the information that comes from infrared spectrum recorded in blue and the Raman spectra in red. Uh, another capability is you can also measure in transmission. Uh, you can even do it on glass because uh, the green laser doesn't absorb by glass. So you can actually look at uh, cells in solution uh, in a transmission mode, both uh, collecting spectra and imaging. Uh, I won't have time to talk about that in uh, today's webinar. So the idea of the IR plus Raman, you already have a green laser to collect the OPTIR spectrum. So that means you can collect a Raman spectrum at the same spot, at the same time, and at the same spatial resolution. So you can take advantage of the full complementarity of IR and Raman uh, in your results. You have one instrument for both IR and Raman, and you can use now uh, novel data analysis strategies to understand your sample. So this is how it looks. It, it's basically the same as the OPTIR technique I described earlier. You have a visible laser that's overlapped with the, with the infrared laser. Uh, the green laser is the probe laser. It's, it's CW. The IR laser is pulsed. You focus down on the sample. You get a modulation of the light uh, intensity when there's an IR absorbance. And then when the beam comes back, uh, you can send it to a visible detector to collect the photothermal infrared spectrum, or you can selectively send the uh, Raman shifted lines to a Raman spectrograph and simultaneously measure uh, infrared and Raman spectra from the same spot at the exact same spatial resolution. There have been many applications out there in polymer materials, life sciences, pharmaceuticals, and contamination failure analysis in both industrial and academic laboratories. I'm going to just go through a few of these before I pass it on to Asao. A couple of weeks ago, uh, Oksana uh, gave a very nice uh, webinar on a recent publication that made the cover of Advanced Sciences on imaging polymorphic am amyloids directly on in neurons, and so these are two spectra from that paper uh, that were collected uh, 282 nanometers apart. You can see the change in the uh, protein secondary structure because the signal to noise of the spectra are high enough. So that's a pretty exciting uh, capability in the life science area. Uh, this is uh, actually from what Asa's going to talk about later. I just want to give you an idea of how the measurement was made. It's a laminate of a polyhydroxyalkanoid uh, polymer with uh, polylactic acid, and it's mounted on edge and clamped in a vise, and then it was just shaved off. So we're actually looking at the edge of the block of the sample, and this is the uh, optical uh, image of the sample where, and, uh, where we have the PHA layer, the PLA layer, and then this boundary area. And we can collect a series of simultaneous infrared and Raman spectra spaced by 100 nanometers uh, across that boundary. We can see how they change as we go from the PHA to the PLA. But we can also sit at a single wave number and collect an image. So if we tune to a crystalline PHA band, we light it where that component is uh, uh, absorbed strongly. If we move over to the PLA band, we light up a different area. And if we go across the boundary, you can see when we hit the boundary at the very edge, we're uh, we're achieving a, what is apparently about 327 nanometer spatial resolution. But in fact, at the boundary, we see we don't get a sharp boundary. That means there's sort of a uh, interaction between the PLA and the PHA. And Asao will go into a lot more detail. And including how to make sense of how the spectra change over the boundary and learn about the mixing of those two, uh, two components. Another example is uh, surface contamination on glass substrates. Uh, so again, you can, uh, these are two different materials absorbed on glass. One of them turns out it's a polyacrylate and, uh, uh, I think it's an acetate, and the other one's a polyamide, and we can get clear spectra identifying these uh, uh, contaminations on the glass, and we can also image them in different colors and see where they are on the surface. Uh, we can also look at defects uh, on semiconductor samples, and so 
this is a big problem uh, where you have a defect and you need to know what it is, we can go in and measure spectra and then do library searches in the infrared and get chemical identifications of uh, on defects that are as thin as 60 nanometers have been detected. Uh, and a recent customer who has one of these instruments has had better than 9% success identifying uh, unknown organic contamination on their, on their um, materials. Uh, it's also sensitive to single, uh, in this case, a 0.9 micron diameter polystyrene bead on the surface. Uh, again, we can we can see one of those beads, collect spectra uh, on the bead and off the bead, and clearly get a spectrum that's liable, library searchable and easily identified as uh, polystyrene. Uh, we can look at uh, uh, fibers. Uh, this is a freestanding nanofibers. So you don't have to an examine a whole fabric. You can actually go in and look at a single fiber. And this is a, an acrylic layer that we got a spectrum of. And also down to a nanofiber. This, in this case, an 800 nanometer uh, fiber. We can collect very nice uh, infrared spectra on two different fibers there. Here's an example of a little bit bigger fiber. But we're able to go on the surface of it. It's a PET fiber uh, that has an additive uh, slip agent added, a steramid, and we can examine various spots on the surface and see where the the additive is occurring on the sample on the fiber sample. Uh, we and this is a recent example from uh, Rudiger Berger at Knox Bach Institute in Mainz. Provided the samples uh, a PLA blended with ACM phase dispersions. Uh, you can see the visible image, and we can go in and collect uh, IR images and ratio the images collected at 1733 and this 1759, which is the PLA bands. And then we can step even finer and get down to 100 nanometer steps. And in three minutes, we can collect these images. And we can get identifiable spectra from the two domains that clearly distinguish the ACM and the PLA. Uh, this is related to the bioplastics uh, discussion that Asawa will go into later. But uh, these days, uh, microplastics are appearing in all over the place in the environment. And this is a simple test case where we took some salt crystals and mixed in some polystyrene beads and PMA beads. The polystyrene beads were one micron, two, two microns, and four and a half, and 10 microns, and the PMA beads were three microns. And we dried them onto a calcium fluoride substrate. And the particles are various sh shapes and sizes, yet the uh, infrared spectra we get out don't change depending on the size. And uh, some of these materials are salt, which don't have an infrared spectra, which would cause all kinds of problems in a normal FTIR measurement. Uh, we can easily get in there and, regardless of the size of the particle, get great chemical ID uh, of the material. And we can collect images where we tune to a single wave number and uh, light up which particles are the PMMA and which particles are the polystyrene. This slide shows uh, a simultaneous IR and Raman uh, spectral collection on a real microplastic sample, which was identified at PET. The particular particle is 5 microns by 8 microns in size. And these are the spectra that we collected in the infrared Raman. took 10 seconds to collect both the spectra. Very good signal to noise and potential for much shorter time measurements. And what we can do with the new uh, Wiley uh, know-it-all search package now so we can do a dual search of these Raman infrared spectra at the same time. And you get a hit index, hit index of the Raman uh, match along the y-axis and a hit index of the infrared in the, uh, match along the x-axis. Here we're seeing the infrared spectrum with the best match, which is a poly uh, polyethylene terephthalate. And, and the next slide, it's the same. Uh, 2D plot, but now we're seeing the match of the Raman spectrum. So sometimes the it won't be clear uh, from just one technique which is the best match, but if you have two, you can definitely separate out the best hit from the other uh, possibilities. So the take-home messages here are that OPTIR takes IR microscopy beyond known traditional and accepted limits. 
essentially combine the best of Iron Raman into a single platform for micron spatial resolution. Uh, it's non-contact reflection measurement with no cross-contamination, no dispersive scatter artifacts, and the spectra are insensitive to sample shape and size, little or no sample preparation. All you have to do is mount the sample, uh, and then by combining with Raman, we can get simultaneous submicron IR and Raman at the same spot at the same time and the same resolution, which gives you confidence in the ability to solve difficult high value problems in research where current analytical tools may not do the job. At this point, I want to pass things off to uh, Asao Noda, who's going to talk about this new uh, publication that just came out in the Journal of Molecular Structure on 2D correlation analysis of the blends of uh, poly, uh, hydroxyalkanoid and PLA. And uh, I was looking through my records and I found out uh, this is actually the 65th paper that Asao and I have published together, and I thought it might be fun to go back and look at the first. And here it is. Our first paper was published together back in 1983. And you might not think there's much connection between dynamic infrared linear dichroism and what we're doing today uh, with this technique. But in fact, if we hadn't done, done this collaborative work back in the early 80s, we probably never would have discovered uh, 2DIR and we maybe never would have got into this bioplastics issue. And just to show what we looked like back then, that's uh, Asao and me back in about 1984 and the guy Tony Dowry who, who uh, was the one who really made the experiment work. So with that, I want to pass things on to my friend and colleague, uh, Asao Noda. Thank you very much, Bart, for the introduction and also the 40 years of friendship and very a fruitful collaboration. So, <clears throat> so, my specialty is plastics. Plastics are a wonderful material. It is convenient, clean, light, not so expens uh, expensive. It really changed how we live our modern life, daily life, with so many wonderful products and packages. But it does come with its own price. We actually produce over 300 million metric tons of plastics every year. And after we use it, well, where do they go? Okay, actually, only a small fraction is recycled or burned or buried. And 10 to 20 percent might even end up in the ocean. And they will stay with us, our future generations, for many centuries to come. So it is a, it is a big issue. One of the possible solutions is to think about making plastics from natural resources, for example, vegetable, from vegetable oil plant, and ferment the vegetable oil to make plastic. And if this plastic is biodegradable, then after you use it, it goes back to the nature and close the entire carbon cycle. It sounds wonderful, and that's the story of the bioplastics norax. Is it possible to do that? Yes. Uh, Daniel Scientific in the United States has started the industrial scale production of bioplastics, norax, DHA, fermenting canola oil. You, you will hear a lot more about this new bioplastics material in months to come. So what is Nodax PHA, polyhydroxy alkanite? This is a chemical structure of this bioplastics, it is aliphatic polyester, made by bacteria. Bacteria accumulate this polyester inside of their body as a carbon and energy storage mechanism, very much so that we store fat in our body. So this is a very well fed bacteria. And after we let them accumulate this polyester, we basically do the liposuction. And this material has a wonderful property, which can be made into a lot of different products, okay, fibers, or even modeled articles, everything. And this material will biodegrade very rapidly at the speed very much like a piece of paper, even in ocean. And the commercial production of this bioplastics started last year, and they are expanding from 
10,000 metric ton by year to about 30,000 metric ton by year in Kentucky. So this is the Nodax PAJ. Today we're going to talk about the composite material made out of PHA with another lactic acid, PLA. PLA is a compostable material, right? Uh, not totally biodegradable, but compostable means it will hydrolyze at elevated temperature and humidity, and it is made from starch derivatives. And for hydroxyalkanate, made by the fermentation of vegetable oil, this is totally biodegradable material, no that. So the combination of this PLA and PHA makes a very interesting class of composite material. Today we're going to talk about the model system of laminate made out of PLA and PHA and use optical for some IR and Raman probe to scan along the line which intersects the interface between PLA and PHA layer. In special scan of about every hundred nanometers of that is connected. So this is a typical uh, spec reflected for the increment. In this case, ten uh, hundred nanometers might uh, increment from PLA side and PHA side. Now we're looking at carbon stretching region, infrared. Of course, the spectral feature changes from PLA dominated region to PHA dominated region with gradual change. But if you overlay this carbon stretching band, you can clearly see that there is no clear isosthetic point. That means this planet system is not a simple binary composite because if so, there should be an isostatic point, but there's a lot more complex interplay of the different components within PA and PH. Fingerprint region also shows the gradual change. This area is a lot more congested, a little more complex. Now, in order to analyze a set of spectra like this, we use additional data sorting technique called two-dimensional correlation spectroscopy. 2D correlation. 2D correlation spectroscopy is basically a tool to sort out complex spectral response to a given perturbation. In our case, the perturbation is the position that we uh, probe the IX spectrum. So if you change the position from one part to the other, spectra will change. And then notice that some part of the spectra will change simultaneously in a very similar way. And other part of the spectra changes in a somewhat dissimilar sequential manner. We create a map to emphasize what part of the spectra is changing simultaneously in a coordinated fashion and the part which is changing asynchronously in sequ sequ uh, sequential changes. And these maps are created by applying cross correlation analysis to the set of spectra. So the similar simultaneous part uh, is described by the spectra called synchronous spectrum. A sequential change part is described as asynchronous spectrum. Here properties are listed here. Synchronous spectrum is a symmetric um, map. This is a Hunter map. You see the peaks located at diagonal position. If the intensity of particular band changes very strongly, there's going to be a very strong peak appearing at the diagonal part that is called auto peaks. If the intensity of particular band does not change much, then their peak intensity becomes very small. If the direction of these two band pair, A and B, for example, are in the same direction, it will be a positive cross peak of diagonal position. On the other hand, A and C, if they are changing in a direction opposite to each other, that means one is increasing while the other is decreasing, there will be a negative cross peaks indicated by the blue shading. This is a synchronous spectrum property. 
This is the spectrum located in sequential order of change. Now for A and B actually are changing slightly different sequence. If the cross peak signs are identical, the same positive, then horizontal band, band A, their intensity changes before the vertical band, band B. Likewise, if A and D, if the those big signs are different, then horizontal band changes after the vertical band intensity. These are the properties that actually become very, very useful. So we're going to use this technique to analyze the spatially resolved spectrum. Now what we see, the cardinal stretch region moving from PA side to PHA side across the interface, we observe two big auto peaks indicating the gradual decrease of PLA intensities, is located to the higher wave number, and gradual increase of PHA signals, which is located on the lower side of the wave number. One is increasing and the other one is decreasing, so you will we actually observe this negative cross peak between PHA and PLA. Asian cross spectrum gives me a lot more detailed picture, which is very interesting. And by going through each cross peaks, actually, we can make the following assertion by moving from the PLA rich side of the laminate to the PHA rich side. We can see initially the sudden increase of the amorphous component or PHA. We start observing the presence of the amorphous component of PHA, followed by the decrease of the crystalline component of PLA, followed by the increase of the crystalline component of PHA, and finally the disappearance of the amorphous part of PLA. So we can actually differentiate the amorphous and crystalline component of the PLA. Likewise, also amorphous and crystalline component of PHA, and we can actually see the spatial distribution of amorphous and crystalline components of PHA and PLA. And the most surprising part is that from the sequence, we can actually see the substantial penetration of the amorphous PHA into the PLA region, and substantial amorphous PLA penetration into the side. Also, the crystalline component of PHA and PLA are much less present near the interface. So around the interface, it is all dominated by amorphous components. So we suddenly have a very detailed picture of the distribution of crystalline and amorphous PHA and PLA at the special resolution for 12 below micron scale. That is scale of molecular segmental level mixing. The PLA and PHA are not miscible polymer, but at segmental level there are some interpenetration of the polymer segments. If you go to the fingerprint region, now this region is very congested, but we can still see the uh, Simultaneous increase of PHA, simultaneous decrease of PLA. These are all the synchronous positive cross peaks and also negative cross peaks between PHA and PLA. So we can actually assign the PLA and PHA origin of these congested fingerprint region. That's the synchronous spectrum. Asynchronous spectrum becomes a lot more complex. So we use the trick of the head mode correlation where you compare the fingerprint region with much better resolved carbonyl stretching region. And here very clearly we can see all the bands which are synchronously correlated with the PHA bands will show up very clearly in the PHA of the fingerprint region. Likewise, PLA and PLA bands well, well resolved in the synchronous spectrum. 
Furthermore, we can see that we can assign that these PAJ ones are actually belonging to amorphous uh, PHA, not crystalline PHA, therefore between crystalline PHA band here and amorphous PHA band here, there are asynchronous cross peaks, that means they are coming from different moiety. Okay, so again the same picture shows up, the substantial penetration of PHA and PHA across the interface, showing some level of parallel mixing, and more amorphous components are found the interface. Now we look into the uh, new capability of the uh, our instrument, which gives you IR and Raman spectra simultaneously at the same spot, at the same resolution. And we observe the IR spectrum of PHA, and IR spectrum of PLA, and Raman spectra of counterpart. They are kind of similar, but actually they are different because of the sensitivity and connectivity of the IR and Raman spectrum approach are different. This is the Raman spectra across the interface. Again, we observe the PLA-rich region moving to the PHA-rich region with some change in between, that is infrared. In the corresponding Raman give you a similar trend. PLA Raman spectrum, PHK Raman spectrum, and in between. Same thing about the fingerprint region. <laughs> now, we apply two dimensional correlation analysis. We observe a very similar result from the higher result. Again, the PLA decreases, PHK increases and there will be a negative cross peak between PHA and PLA. And again, we can tell crystalline and amorphous PHA and crystalline and amorphous PLA distributed in a very much the following fashion from the PLA side, PHA side, amorphous penetration of PHA is observed followed by a decrease of the crystalline part of the PLA and increase of crystalline part of PHA, and then still the residual interpenetration of amorphous PLA. So the results are essentially the same as IR results. Again, penetration of amorphous PHA and PLA across the interface is observed, suggesting some level of partial mixing at segmental level of the polymers. And these penetrations, this source of unusually high compatibility between pH and PLA, which becomes very important for the application. Now, if you compare the infrared spectra and Raman spectra back to the correlation, something interesting happens. The synchronous spectrum will give you a very similar story. Okay? PHA Raman and PHA IR, they are synchronously correlated and they have the auto peaks. Likewise, the increase of the IR, uh, decrease uh, uh, PLA, and increase of the Raman PHA, again, opposite direction gives you negative cross peaks. However, if you look at the asynchronous spectrum, there's very strong asynchronous responses between PHA versus PHA or PLA versus PLA, indicating that actually there is a strong probe sensitivity between IR and Raman probe in this study. Now, we are observing these uh, sample at the same spot simultaneously with same spatial resolution, but IR results and Raman results are slightly different, indicating the probe sensitivity most likely arising from the selectivity and sensitivity of different probes showing different results. 
Finally, I'll talk about this uh, newly developed correlation technique called two trace two dimensional correlation analysis. Here we are comparing only two spectra, adjacent spectra, separated only by 100 nanometers near the interface. Their spectra actually look essentially identical, very, very similar spectra. If you have only two spectra, you can still apply two dimensional correlation analysis, and we can see that these two spectra shows the asynchronous peak between polylactic acid down here and DHA bar here. So you can tell that this one and this one are coming from different species and the position of this band here the dominant band is about 1753 and then this part is 1730 which is DHA band. So yes asynchronous spectrum shows that these two spectra still show a slight difference between components. Now we can apply this information and go back to the spectra and look at the part which is synchronized with 1753 bands, either one. If you extract the spectral portion which is synchronized with 1753, you observe the following spectrum. Likewise, if you extract only the part which is synchronized with 1730 bands, you observe the following band. Okay, these are derived from two spectra adjacent to each other, separated by only 100 nanometers. However, if you look at the pure PLA, the pure PHA, immediately becomes obvious that this spectrum corresponds to PHA, and this part corresponds to PHA. So we can actually extract component spectra coming from very similar spectra collected adjacent points. And these are very exciting development which will become a, another tool for the uh, hyperspectral range analysis. In summary, the interface of laminate made from biodegradable for PHA and PLA was probed with submicron scale uh, probes using large optical photothermal imaging spectrometer, which was assisted also by 2D condensation analysis. And we observed the interesting penetration of PLA and PHJ into each other, and also decreased crystallinity near interface. Simultaneous and same spot IR Brahman measurement to reveal that their response was slightly different, which was also a very fascinating result, indicating probe sensitivity and selectivity of these two complementary probes. So, to the correlation, we really allow the study of even very similar spectrum collected from adjacent spectra only 100 nanometers apart, indicating the component spectra for the future uh, analysis. So these are the summary, but again, this is all giving you a very exciting possibility of designing and using the bioplastic derived from vegetable oil and fermentation to make a various product which will go back to nature, which will be all design and development will be assisted by the state-of-the-art analytical tools such as Fred and Brahman uh, high specially resolved spectroscopy. Okay, thank you so for that. Uh, thank you, Kurt, for that really uh, interesting uh, and in-depth presentation on your collaborative work uh, based on your publication. In uh, context of time, uh, we'll jump straight into uh, a few uh, questions that we have had coming in as you guys have been speaking. Uh, the first one I can see, and that's uh, is the depth of sampling. Uh, Kurt, I think that's a good one for you. Yeah. Uh, the penetration depends on uh, 
a lot of different features, including the modulation of the laser and the photothermal diffusion properties. But in general, I think the best way to think about it is that it's about the same as an ATR measurement, about a micron or so into the top surface of the sample is the uh, depth of penetration that's typically probed. All right, next one here I've got is, uh, how do you handle fluorescing samples since you're using a green laser? Well, the fluorescence uh, does affect the Raman spectrum. Uh, if it fluoresces, it can totally swap it out, but it won't affect the infrared, uh, photothermal infrared at all. Uh, sample can fluoresce like crazy, and you'll still get a perfectly fine uh, OPTIR spectrum. Okay, thank you. Um, this one sounds like a good one for ISO. Let me read this out. Um, why is partial mixing of PLA and PHA uh, such big, uh, what, what is the consequences, what are the consequences? PLA and PHA are immiscible polymer pairs, but they have very, very high compatibility. And this is the first scientific basis for the insight into why they are so compatible, so that we can mix it together to make highly dispersed blends and design other useful uh, uh, composite material beyond simple model laminate system. Okay, this will probably have to be our last question. Um, and again, this one I, I think is for you. Uh, why do you need 2D correlation analysis for specially resolved data sets? 2D correlation gives you a very quick root uh, answer to the very fine detailed variation of the spectrum. The simple question that many people ask is, why can't we use more traditional chemometrics technique, like as a multivariate curve resolution analysis? Now, these uh, techniques works fine, but except for the features which are highly overlapped, for example, the morphos and the crystalline components of the PHA and PLA, there it is very difficult to obtain the convergence and clear answer. The decoration gives a very nice starting point. Of course, you can combine chemometric technique with the decoration to obtain the better result. Thank you, uh, uh, both Kurt and Isola, for taking the time to present your fascinating work to us and uh, thank you to the audience for telling uh, if any questions haven't been answered uh, we'll be sure to get back to you or email as soon as possible at the end uh, this uh, webinar uh, has been recorded uh, for later on by viewing so um, please feel free to share the links with your friends and colleagues who may be interested and on that note everybody have a good day good night thank you bye, -bye.